Clear prop. Star 73, Cherokee number two, following twin traffic, three mile final. There's a still one trial at Bravo, makes for runway 25, going uh, four mile final. This is Behind the Prop with United Flight Systems owner and licensed pilot Bobby Doss and his co host, major airline captain and designated pilot examiner Wally Mulhern. Now let's go Behind the Prop. What's up, Wally? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I am fantastic. We are recording part four of Common Checkride Airs, a series that has uh, spanned a few months now, a couple months now, and uh, we have Pat Brown back on the show. Thanks for joining us again, Pat. Hey, my pleasure. This has been fun. Heck of a time for sure, and I'm sure based on the statistics that our listeners are loving these shows, they are jumping up the, the top listens list very quickly. And I think everyone's going to love this show. We have finally made our way to instrument check rides and common errors. And we got a lot to talk about, but Wally wanted to kick us off with uh, something he thinks a lot about and it's important for all of us. So go ahead, Wally, tell us, tell us where we're starting here. Yeah, I just want to talk about instrument flying as opposed to maybe an instrument check ride. Um, just think of of governmental certifications or licenses or whatever in, in across the board, medical, uh, legal, whatever. Um, try to think of one license or certification that you can get without ever having done what you're being certified to do. And that's an instrument rating. An instrument rating, uh, you, can, you can get an instrument rating never having flown in the clouds and that's essentially what you're 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 being allowed to do with an instrument rating um that i mean that's an oversimplification of it um so what i would encourage the instrument students to do is to the best that you can to insist from your instructor that of that 40 hours of instrument time at least some of it is actual time because there's just, well, you can put on a view limiting device, you can put on foggles, a hood, whatever, um, and, and meet the requirements, but there's just nothing like uh, actually getting in the clouds and flying. And, you know, once you get the instrument rating, you know, instrument flying is a, a, a highly erodible skill. In other words, as a new instrument pilot, um, it goes away in a hurry. It, it really does. So it, it is something that, that you need to get out there and do. And I think what a lot of people probably do, they're probably okay with getting six instrument approaches within the last um, six months. But I, I question how many people are actually going and flying in clouds. Um, and it's not a requirement. It's not. Um, so look for that day, you know, after you get your instrument, look for that day that's 1800 broken and go out and fly and, and maybe get vectored around at 2000 feet where you're kind of going in and out of the clouds. Okay, get your, your confidence level up a little bit, then go out and do it again, then find a day that's maybe 1600 broken then a day that's 1900 overcast then i don't know you know keep keep pushing yourself we certainly don't want to do anything unsafe you know we don't want to go out in icing conditions or anything like that but this is something that um you know once you check the box of why i have my instrument rating uh you you've got to use it you absolutely have to use this to to be uh, a safe pilot. And at the end of the day, the day that's what we're trying to do. I, I can remember uh, hearing a, uh, a flight instructor one time say that they were nervous about their, the student that was coming in that afternoon. It was an instrument student. And this particular flight instructor only had two tenths of actual instrument time. Legal, yes. And, and maybe that instructor was a very good instructor. I don't know. But um, yeah, a little bit of a head scratcher to me. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember that I, uh, I, I did something similar we're talking about, but it's probably 3000 broken <laughs> when I first did it. And I would, I went to new Bronzeville's on my first solo cross country IFR flight and it was 3000 broken. I was in and out the whole way there. 
but felt very confident that if I needed to, I could also get, get below it and fly safely the rest of the wow. way. But it was a great experience. And without that little, little bit, little bit, little bit, it would have, you know, I would have never got to night IFR with my wife in the plane. And, uh, the, each experience makes you a better pilot for sure. You know, that you, that, that pilot that you describe, um, describes me to a T. Um, I got my instrument rating in 91 days here in Houston without one minute in the clouds. And I, I, I could tell you a story would be 20 minutes, but I'm not going to take that kind of time. But I'll just tell you that, that two weeks after that, I had a meeting in another city and I was bound and determined come hell or high water. I'm going to fly IFR to that trip. I don't care what the weather is because I got my instrument rating. And um, anyway, I scared myself so bad on that trip. And this is, this is not a joke. I scared myself so bad on that trip. I didn't fly IFR for five years after that trip. And in fact, I had my double I. Um, uh, some, some time after that, I went and got my double I just because I figured, let me just get it and add, add it on to my CFI. And, um, and I didn't have any actual time as a double I. When yeah. I got a telephone call from a very good friend of mine, excellent pilot who wanted to get his instrument rating, I thought, crap, I, what am I going to do? I can't turn it down. So we just won't fly in the clouds until the day that we had 800 foot overcast. He says, let's go fly. And what am I going to do? You know, I should have told him no, but, you know, it's one of those uh, male testosterone pride things is that, no, nope, you know, okay. So I didn't, I, he never, to this day, he doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, he does now. He's listening. Yeah, well, he, he, I would have to call his name so he knows who it is. But, but the point is that uh, uh, it, Wally's point, it is a perishable skill. I tell everybody I sign off on an IFR uh, ticket, every flight you make for the next six months, VFR or IFR, I don't care, every flight you make the next six months, file and ask for an yeah. approach on both ends. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You I agree with that. Radio skills. You got to keep up the buttonology skills, um, and then and then go find. Don't be afraid to find the clouds. And get get a safety pilot. Get somebody to just go with you, just to help you watch the gauges, help you watch the dials, make sure you don't feel forget anything that you're any buttons you're supposed to push. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do to to boost that confidence. It doesn't necessarily have to have it be an instructor in the right seat. Yeah, no doubt. The last thing I'll add is, is I see a lot of opportunity for even private students for some of that three hours to be actual. Mm -hmm. And I think that's yeah, the best. Absolutely. I, I think they're the best instructors in the world when they proactively teach that, look, this is going to be fine. I'm rated proficient current. And I want you to see what it's like, yeah. because this will prevent you from ever actually getting in the clouds because you're going to do everything you can to prevent it from happening once you feel what it's really like to go in there. So it doesn't have to be all three hours, but man, if you can get 0.5 in, in a little bit of overcast, you know, 6,000 overcast, get up there and stay in it for a little while and come back out. One of the questions, the best thing I, ever. sorry, Bobby, one of the, one of the questions that, uh, that I'll ask when we're talking about cloud clearance visibility requirements in a private check ride is um, at some point I might ask the question, you know, because when, when they talk about personal minimums, well, you know, I'm, if I got three miles visibility or so, you know, blah, blah, blah. And my first question is, well, have you actually ever flown in three miles visibility? No. Okay, let's talk about that for a little bit, uh, because that is yeah. monumentally stupid. But anyway, I know we're not here to talk about, uh, about that, but uh, um, it kind of tied in for a minute. So as we got started, I asked the guys, the DPEs, what, what was some of the stuff that may happen before or after? And that, that topic came up. The other one that came up is being qualified for these check rides is the first step that any DP is going to do. So we've talked about private for quite a bit over two shows. We talked about commercial. Now we're talking about instrument to qualify for the instrument rating. There's instrument check ride. There's a number of things that you have to be able to do. And one of those is this mysterious 10 hours of instrument or simulated instrument flight time to qualify. Um, and what, what's the best thing that they should do to, to do this 10 hours. And I think I'm talking commercial check, right? But what's the, what's the, what's the way that CFIs need to log it and students need to make sure their instructors are logging it to save them a lot of headache down the road. Well, uh, you know, of course, you know, in your logbook, you should be 
the instructors to be logging, you know, we did a VOR approach or we did an ILS or we did a local, whatever, you know, we, we did, we did uh, I don't know, steep turns under the hood. We did unusual attitudes. I mean, th those things should be in the logbook, but um, at least, at least 10 hours of the instrument training should refer to 61.129, which is a commercial reg, but it's the one that uh, requires the 10 hours of instrument time uh, uh, using a view limiting device. Um, and that's, that's a really important phrase with the use of a view limiting device. Actual, even 10 hours of actual conditions don't, don't qualify as silly as that may sound. And there are, there are FAA interpretations that say just that, and just because you have an instrument rating <clears throat> doesn't mean that you qualify for the commercial certificate. And as silly as that may sound, it's monumentally silly as far as I'm concerned, but that's the way the regs are written. So if you have any inkling, any inkling at all at some point that you're gonna go for your commercial certificate, make sure that at least 10 hours of, of your instrument training are logged in accordance with 61.129. And if you really wanna make sure that it's right, add the phrase with the use of a view limiting device. So that would be that would be my caveat. Yeah, and all the instructors have to do is is make the you know when they, they sign it put IAW in accordance with sixty one point one twenty nine. That's yeah. all it takes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that then that, that's a relatively recent thing too. Um, I don't know exactly when it came into play, but back when I was doing a lot of instrument training uh, when I had the flight school. Um, I don't think I ever referred to that um, that um, that reg, and yet sent people up for commercial rides, and and it was never questioned. Um, yeah. But then it became a thing, and I'm just going to arbitrarily say six or seven years ago is probably about mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And um, and because it is a thing now, um, it has created some some real real problems. In fact, um, uh, without. This is maybe slightly off topic, but the other thing is on the 250 mile ride, um, it used to be up until about six or eight months ago, it used to be that you had to fly three approaches using three different types of uh, systems. But that was, uh, that was rescinded, that FAA interpretation was rescinded about six or eight months ago to indicate that you just have to fly three different types of approaches. So where in the past, the ILS and the localizer were considered the same system and therefore were not acceptable. Now they're two different kinds of approaches and an ILS and a localizer would be acceptable. So uh, that's, that's, that's a big help for uh, the instructor community now. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I got my instrument rating about five and a half years ago. And when I went to my commercial training shortly thereafter, it was not a big deal but it was something that started getting questioned and um, we made sure everything was correct in my logbook at that time as well. So much like the other episodes, let's talk about pre uh, the oral, the, the, before the flight, we're in our exam room or wherever you take your check rides at your flight school or airport, you sit down with the DPE and I've, I've now I've been qualified and kind of the clock starts, the orals began. Um, you guys have to have a million stories, but Let's let's hit the high ones. Where where do people struggle in the oral for the instrument rating that uh, should be called out? Wally, go first. Well, uh, you know, I, I start with with my with my applicants. I start talking about the cross country flight that I I gave them, and um, uh, I I will always say to them, um, you know, I'll say, okay, for our purposes, you are instrument rated and qualified. Um, and I'll say you got your instrument rating three months ago, and I'll just make something up like that. And uh, one thing that I always find very funny is I will say, um, can we make this flight today? And, and they may say, oh, no, no, it's, it's, um, it's IFR at the destination. It's, it's um, 900 broken, so I, I can't go. And I'll say, you can't go? Oh, no, no. And I'll say, okay, you can't go or you will not go. No, I, I can't go. And I said, but, but your instrument rated. 
and and sometimes you kind of see a light bulb go off in their head and they go oh i can go and uh and of course for the purpose of the oral we're we're gonna go at least in our our little um uh role playing thing that we do um then probably the next you know one of the after we we discuss the cross country and and uh the need for an alternate um I, I, a lot of people learn things with crutches and uh, maybe acronyms. Um, I'll say, okay, so well, tell me when an alternate is required. And they'll say, oh, it's the one, two, three rule. Okay, what, what does that mean? And boy, sometimes they struggle. They, they can throw out the one, two, three rule. All right, I'm going to defend all of them. Wally, you know what the one, two, three rule is. Why don't you accept that? Well, I, you know, one, two, three, it's one, two, three strikes and you're out. Right. Okay. Are we talking baseball? And speaking of baseball, I will say, well, tell me what you need to be considered current six hits. Okay. Is that two singles, two doubles, a triple and a home run? What, what is that? And, and, and a lot of people struggle with it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're going to learn that, don't, you know, just, just, Make sure you know what it really, what it means, what it says. Yeah, I, I, I tend to uh, hit the weather a little bit harder than I do on uh, private and, and commercial um, because that's what you're flying in. And right. you better have a, a reasonably good idea of what kind of weather you're going to encounter when you're in flying in the vicinity of a low pressure system or a cold front or something like that. And, you know, and there's some nuances um, to the kind of weather that you could expect on a cold front. Is it a Pacific front or is it, is it a blue Norther coming down from Canada with a huge amount of energy behind it? Um, so, you know, I, I, they don't need to be a meteorologist and I would never try to hold anyone to that standard because I'm certainly not. But I think it's fair to be able to point to a <clears throat> to a, a random surface analysis chart to uh, some sort of a weather symbol on that surface analysis chart, and they're all common symbols. And just say, um, you know, if 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 our flight path were to take us across this, would it, let's just say randomly, it's a warm front, or 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 trough or a dry line or whatever the case may be, if our flight path were to take us in through or in the vicinity of this, what kind of flight conditions could you expect? Um, and then just sit back and, and watch them kind of, some of them kind of really flail and some of them um, just really don't have a clue. And, um, you know, there they're, they're starts to be like your one strike you know, <laughs> and maybe two, depending on, and, and then, and then some of them will struggle reading uh, coded METARs and TAFs. Well, okay, I, I get that you can click a button and have it decoded for you, but there's some really compelling reasons. We don't have to get into them here, but there's some really compelling reasons to know how to read coded weather. Uh, yeah. One of which is, it's, I think it's just easier, but that's, that's beside the point. Um, um, so they struggle with with reading uh, METARs and, and, and TAFs. And um, personally, I really like it when they pull out for flight and pull out the briefing. Uh, I'll ask them, well, you know, where did for flight get all of this this weather information from? And, uh, you know, I, I get all kinds of answers as for where that come. You know, it goes from the FAA, you know, or. Uh, from the Weather Channel or the Internet. Okay, okay. well, let's we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. But but I really like it when they open up for flight and we start going through the actual briefing for the trip, and that gives me an opportunity to ask them to decode a METAR, to look at the little wind barbs and I don't know how strong are those wind barbs, and you know look at it in the context of the check ride. So I actually like it when they pull for flight out. Yeah, and and another thing, speaking of reading those. Um those charts is um, as simple as being able to convert to uh, um, Zulu time or yeah. UCT, whatever we want to, whatever we want to call it. Yeah. Um, that that's a problem, uh, you know, and, and most people, at least these days, um, you know, an Apple watch is, is something that a lot of people have. You can put a second time zone on there. Um, yeah. I happen to have one of the, 
the really, I think, really cool Garmin Pilot watches. I have GMT always, always displayed on mine. Uh, so if I can't add five or six or whatever it happens to be based on your time zone, if I'm struggling with that, all I got to do is look at my watch and it's right there. Yeah. So that, that's that's something that's, you know, and, and I'm going to tell you, I mean, um, you know, as my airline pilot about six hours ago, I was reading this. I was flying from Maui to um, Denver. And um, before we can uh, continue into ETOPS airspace, we have to have certain weather minimums. And we got to look at our ETOPS alternates. And, uh, you know, it comes across the printer. And there we are. We're you know, discussing with the first officer. Okay, Honolulu right now is looking good. It's for the next six hours, it's going to be good. San Francisco is this. Yes, we can continue. So it's not something that is that we just do in a classroom. It is something that is uh, very real world. Mm -hmm. So I hit that pretty hard. And, and uh, along with chart symbology, um, um, you know, they don't have to know everything. But, you know, when I point to that little A in the triangle on an approach plate, and uh, because at some point when we're talking about the cross country, I'll say, you know, um, with the, the, the subject of an alternate will come up because I'll give them something like you do. It's 900 feet or, you know, it's a quarter mile visibility or a half mile visibility or whatever. And, and how does that affect your flight planning? Well, we'll need an alternate. So what's your alternate? And normally um, uh, they'll, they'll choose, you know, what, whatever. Um, I don't want to give away too much on the oral, but you know they'll they'll choose an alternate. I'm kind of expecting them to choose, and I'll have a copy of the approach plate printed, and I'll put it out in front of them and say, "Well, what's that little A right there?" And uh, alternate minimums. Okay, great. What are they? Uh, um, well, they'll start reading the text next to it, but that's not necessarily what what I'm looking for them to do. And and sometimes they don't realize that that I'm expecting them to go to the you know, the, to, to the, uh, uh, to, to the uh, in four flight and, you know, that where you can find the alternate minimums or look in the approach plate uh, packet that they have uh, where they can actually go to the alternate minimums and, you know, maybe, maybe alternate minimums at that airport are a thousand feet and three miles is ability. I don't know, but um, they, they don't, they don't understand what alternate minimums are oftentimes. Yeah. So all good stuff, all things that are going to come up. Do you spend much time talking about um, lost comms and the oral component? Yes. And I got to think uh, they use some of their acronyms to think through their thought process and control that um, mental conversation for themselves. Do people do pretty good with lost comms? Yeah, generally speaking, we, but if, when you throw a, when you throw a situation at them that allows them perhaps not to um, follow the Avenue F, MEA, uh, <laughs> speaking of acronyms, uh, that where they can legally deviate from that, they, they don't stop to realize that they have emergency authority. Right. So I'll throw, I'll throw them a scenario like that. How about you, Alan? Well, what I, what I talk about with that is, um, you know, I talk about, I do talk about lost calm and, and I, I say, well, in a given airplane, I said, what probably is the most likely reason to have lost calm? And, uh, you know, what, what most of the airplanes that we fly have two communications radios and what are the chances that just both of them are going to go out? pretty remote um and it'll eventually get to a um, total electrical failure and in a total electrical failure you have lost calm but you also have lost nav okay so now what are we going to do and uh you know you can and and there, there there's really there's not a whole lot. Of, well, the, the book answer is, is to find BFR weather and go mm -hmm. land. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but what I tell them is it is 1000 overcast ever, you know, within, within the range of the airplane, there's nowhere we can go. What are we going to do? Well, and, Molly, um, don't people just squawk 7,700? 
at that point. Well, that's what the, that's what people <laughs> tell me. I'll say, okay, so you must have one of those new solar powered transponders. <laughs> and go, oh, oh yeah, yeah. The transponder's not going to work. Well, I'll just navigate to here. Okay, you got one of those solar powered GPSs. Oh yeah, yeah. So what are you going to do? How are you going to navigate? Well, I'll use use my pre computed and um, and my printed out nav log. Okay, that's great. Yeah, it's got headings, it's got times and all that. Okay, well, how are we gonna get down? And um, th there's no real book answer to it, but um, I, I think it's a it's a, a scenario that could happen. I mean, I most people who've listened to the show know that I've, I've had a total electrical failure in a Saratoga and it was a clear, blue, beautiful day. So. I was on an IFR flight plan and I went and landed and then called up Houston center and or, or approach and said, Hey, I'm on the ground. Everything's good. I had an electrical failure. Had that happened in the weather, um, it, it would have been, it would have been a challenge. So, you know, we get into that, that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't remember why I was so worried about it, but I spent a lot of time memorizing like VOR service volumes and, you know, all this stuff that, uh, that are probably on cheat sheets and things, but what, what's the practical, what is y'all's practical part of that? Like, I mean, that's important, I guess, but it's not in that situation. I, I'm not going to really worry about the volume limits of no. this VOR. Right. Well, you know, no. some of this is, yeah. You know. Some of this is changing anyway because of the minimum operational network. And, um, you know, we will, as of, as of January 2020, we were supposed to have had about half the number of VORs that, that we had 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, so that means maybe, what, well, like 500 of them around the country when, when yeah. the MON is finally finished. And part of the MON is that, um, if you're above 5,000 feet AGL anywhere in the country, you should be able to pick up a VOR. So at the end of the day, this, you know, memorizing it business about service volumes is really kind of a moot point because uh, things are changing with the MON, but above 5,000 feet anywhere in the United States, you should be able to pick up a, a VOR. And in fact, I had a chance to test that out when we were flying to Sun and Fun the other day. Um, there was a VOR that was really close. We were, I think, uh, 9,500 feet heading over there, uh, or 9,000 feet where I our flight plan. And, um, and I like to triangulate on my way over, even though we're following the magenta line and the autopilot's doing all the work, I still like to triangulate my position with VORs. It keeps me occupied and keeps those skills sharp. And um, there was a couple of them that were, uh, that were on the map that I couldn't pick up. They were really, really close to us. So, well, they, maybe they've be, been decommissioned. Um, I didn't notice in the NOTAMs that they weren't operational, but uh, so I just started going to see how far away I could find one. And um, I, I don't remember what the distance was now, but it was probably 100 miles or more. And I was able to find a VR that worked. But again, we were at 9,000 feet. So, mm -hmm. testing right. out that, that, you know, that idea of above 5,000 feet, you guaranteed a reception. Well, at nine thousand feet, I certainly was. So anyway, I don't don't that's that's a that's a waste of time in my opinion of, of memorizing that kind of stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I guess I, I'm talking about my own experience, but uh, holds and hold entries. How much time <laughs> in the oral? Surely, the, Bobby's not the only one that struggles with this. Yeah, I definitely i I talk about it. What I do is is I. Uh, I give them a diversion scenario in our, the cross country. I'll say, okay, we're going from here to there. Let's say uh, we get halfway there and one of us has to use the restroom really bad and we decide we're gonna divert to here. So it's an airport that they're, they're probably we're not expecting to talk about. And I'll say, okay, based on the actual current weather right now at that airport so they they have to go and look it up um you know what ex what approach could we expect and of course you know it's usually based on the the winds okay we'd i'd expect the rnav to runway 18 okay well let's talk about that let's say we we um we fly this approach and and uh, you know we'll get into 
you know, the minimums on the approach, uh, is it a precision approach, a non-precision approach, all that kind of stuff. And, and somewhere on that approach is a holding pattern. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And again, it's, it's hopefully one that they're, they're probably not expecting. So, um, you know, they're going to have to look at, look at some different things. Anything with you, uh, specific holds Pat? Um, you know, I don't, I don't talk too much about that in the oral week. I mean, we cover a little bit, but um, for, for me in flight um, is where, the, where the, the deficiencies really show up because um, invariably that darn GPS with the, with the magenta line is going to fail just about the time we hit the holding point. Go figure. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I really need to talk to Garmin about reliability there. But um, uh, the situational awareness is huge. And my experience with, with instrument check rides is um, if, if they're going to bust a ride, um, that certainly is a high probability of the place where it's going to happen. Uh, how about you? Wally? Yeah, uh, no, no I, I, I don't think I've ever really thought about it. But now that you mention it, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, one thing that when we're when we're trying to establish ourselves in a holding pattern um a lot of people just they they never factor in wind and um okay i'm gonna turn to this heading and and those are all you know uh, that 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 initial turn to fly a teardrop entry or whatever that's that's just kind of a you know 30 degrees off that's kind of recommended but if if you got a you know, if, if let's say uh, you're heading 270 and, and uh, you're going to turn to a heading of 240, but you got a strong, strong wind out of the north, you know, 240 may be too much. So mm -hmm. um, we, we got to factor those things in and and use some pilot knowledge. We, we you know, we're pilots. We we've got to we got to use our brain a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So we softly transitioned really there from the oral to the flying opponent. And, and I'm not sure how much y'all spend on an IFR taxi checklist or, you know, how many people really fail. That's probably written on their knee board or something. Unless you guys say otherwise, let's jump right to the flight, right? I'd say yeah. let's, let's jump to the flight. So we're wheels up. Uh, we're heading, we're heading on our cross country. We enter the clouds, uh, assumedly putting our foggles on if it's, a VFR day and I, I, you don't have to give your secrets of how you start your rides, but I assume there's a, an immediate attempt to track or get on something, uh, pretty, pretty quickly there. Uh, I, I don't, I, I mean, mine is no secret. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll tell that it will, in fact, we'll have a discussion. It's exactly what we're going to do before we take off. Um, cause I don't like there to be any surprises, um, you know, in, in that respect. And, uh, I typically start off with unusual attitudes and then out of hooks, we'll usually, um, we'll usually head over to Navasota and, uh, I'll have them, uh, intercept a radial and track it, uh, over there. And we'll do the hold is published and then we'll do the, the, um, procedure turn and do the VOR, uh, circle to land. Take that takes care of four or five of the requirements right there before, yeah, uh, yeah. and then come back and uh, <coughs> finish the ride. So um, it's it's no it's no surprise for me uh, from me when we get in the airplane. They know exactly what we're going to do. Got you. Yeah, I I I I do. Mine is very very similar. I mean, we we didn't compare notes, but it's it's kind of uh, interesting how similar they are. But uh, you know. <laughs> This is this is crazy, um, but I have seen this on multiple occasions. I I won't have them intercept a radial as much as I will have them intercept a Victor Airway, which, which is a radial. But so you know, I won't say fly heading so and so intercept the zero nine zero degree radial of the Navasota VOR. I will say fly heading X intercept Victor three zero six. And um, it, it, it's crazy. I, I, I have seen people put 306 
in the Corsaro, and then they fly and they track outbound on the 306 degree radial. And, uh, you know, I, I, God, that, that's just a head scratcher thinking, oh, what are, what are you, what are you doing? And it's scary. Quite frankly, it's scary. Yeah. I've told the story many times, but Wally, you made me shoot a partial panel VOR approach and at the day Z, I believe. And I, you know, I had never practiced that. And and I think students, applicants need to understand that they're getting certified to be able to do anything in any airplane um, right. that has the equipment and, and they got to be ready for those sorts of things. As we have a few minutes left, what, what do you think some of the you mentioned one head scratcher, but what are some of the things, the biggest gaps in the actual flying components that people struggle with that either CFIs need to do better teaching and spend more time on it, or applicants need to spend more time studying and working on it uh, related to the flying components of the check ride? I would say uh, a lot of times I just see a lack of familiarity or, or competence with the equipment. Um, you know, that they, they just don't really know how that 530 or that G1000 or, or whatever works. Um, uh, you know, uh, and that's a big deal. And, and that's something that, you know, a lot, most, I'm, I, I don't know, but, uh, many flight schools have simulators. This is stuff that can be done in a simulator on that really cruddy weather day and for a lot cheaper than uh than in an airplane and um so i i i see that i, I don't know about you pat yeah that's that's a that's a big deal you know forgetting to do simple things like switching the box back and forth from gps to VLOC is a is a thing to miss dialing yeah. frequencies um uh, misunderstanding. Oh, readbacks, readbacks to clearances. Um, yeah. Some of them feel like they need to read back the clearance word for word, and they don't. You know, right. the, the ATC really cares about about altitudes and, and and clearances. So, you know, if they tell you to turn X heading and uh, you're you know your your X miles from the final approach fix, turn left heading X to and. Uh, maintain why till established they don't really care so much about the heading but they sure as heck want to hear the altitude until established and and the yeah. approach so, yeah and they don't they certainly don't care that you read back six miles from such and such intersection no 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 no, no. in fact in fact if you if you do that in busy airspace you're going to piss them off and, right. Um, right so so you know i i stress with my students and and in, in the debrief uh I, I stress with my applicants you know be selective about read back what you have to uh we don't right. want, we don't want to we don't want to make them play 20 questions but but don't read back any more than you absolutely have to and for the most part most of the time that's altitude and cleared for the approach or altitude and heading if they're giving you a a vector somewhere uh, especially if there's a change of altitude, you know, turn left heading 270, climb and maintain 3,000 feet. Okay, 270, 3,000 feet. Okay, but like Wally says, you, you don't need to, um, you don't need to read back um, six miles from the fix, you know, and in right. fact, if they say at or above, the, you know, cross X fix at or above 3,000 feet, my response is 3,000 feet at X. Yeah. And yeah. and because because I they just don't want me um, you know, below that at that point. So, right. So just try to simplify it. And so, so instructors and instructors could do a, a, a really uh, do a, a real service for their applicants to help them figure out how to properly edit a read back. Yeah. And, and the, the, please don't read back altimeters. The controllers <laughs> don't care. And if you read it back wrong, the controller is probably not going to catch it anyway. Yeah. Exactly. So what's the point? Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, that actually brings up a little something called expectation bias. You know, Wally, we've talked about that, that before, um, you know, I used to teach my, my students and, and we'll have a conversation about that with applicants as well. Um, after you phone for a while, you kind of know what to expect when you're, when a clearance is coming, but just because you think you know what to expect doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you're actually going to get. And I've had students and I've had applicants read back 
uh, what they thought they heard based on what they expected to hear and not what yeah. they really did hear. Right. And, and on check rides, I've had that happen. And uh, that becomes a real issue. Yeah. So, so let's, let's say we've shot these great approaches. We're coming in like we're on our last approach. Do, do people struggle with MDA and DA on these different approaches? I seem to hear a lot of chatter about that in the hallways and conversations. Um, what, what are your views on that ending part of the, of the go miss and what, what my altitude should be and where, when, when, should, when should I stop? They do. Uh, and one thing I, I have, uh, when, when I do that divert scenario, I will say, uh, okay, tell me what the missed approach point is on this approach. And, um, you know, if it's a, a precision approach, which it's usually not, um, you know, it's usually a distance from a VOR or uh, maybe it's an actual fix. But the, the answer I get a lot is it's the end of the runway. And, and now that fix or that DME might be at the end of the runway. And, and then I will say, well, if we're in the clouds, how do we know we're at the end of the runway? And they, they start to scratch their heads. So don't say the end of the runway is the missed approach point because uh, you may not see it. So you need to know how we define at what point we go missed approach, which that's called the missed approach point. So, uh, and again, on a precision approach, it's, it's usually a decision altitude. It's an altitude at which the decision to continue or go missed approach is made, okay? On a non-precision approach, it's not, it's something else. It may be time. You could do, you know, a VOR approach. You might, need, to, to do a VOR approach, maybe all you need is one VOR. Well, how do we know when we're 5.1 miles from the VOR? We don't know it but we can look at the chart on the bottom and come up with a ground speed. And again, it's ground speed. So if you're coming in at 90 knots and you're 172 and you've got a, a, uh, you know, a 10 knot headwind, well, you got to make adjustments because now your ground speed is 80 knots. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good stuff. Anything to add there, Pat? Um, when you tell them that we're going to go missed or that we're going to go a low approach, um, uh, they, they, some of them think that a low approach means we're going to go right on down through the minimums and buzz the runway. And that ain't, that ain't it. <laughs> right. You know, we're going to, we're going to stop at the MDA and we're going to fly to the missed approach point And there's your, that's your low approach. And then we're going to go ahead and execute the mist. Some of them will execute the mist before on a GPS approach in particular, will execute the mist and start the turn before we actually get to the missed approach point. They'll get down to the yes. end and they'll yes. start the turn. And they don't understand the difference between a fly over point, waypoint, and a fly by waypoint. Um, right. And that, I mean, that's not so, not so much on the approach, but uh, uh, I remember when the Eagle Lake uh, VOR was still uh, working and, and we would go out there and we would hold east of the west of the VOR and then have to fly over the VOR and intercept the outbound and do the procedure turn to come back in. And because they have the GPS on board showing them uh, anticipating the turn, they would, they would almost all of them would actually start the turn when the box said turn five, four, three, two, one turn. And they hadn't gone over the GPS yet or, or over the mm -hmm. VOR yet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my point, uh, depending on how well the check ride went, that might just have been a debrief item. But, but my, my, my question is, how do we know that we passed the VOR? How do we know that? Because we, right. didn't, get, we didn't get a flag flip. That's a flyover. Right. That's a flyover checkpoint. You know, it, does, it doesn't look like a flyover waypoint, but it's a flyover checkpoint. And, and so I think a, a lot of applicants don't fully kind of understand that, that just because the GPS says you can cut the corner doesn't necessarily mean that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Agreed. Well, everyone listening uh, and all the flight instructors out there, these will probably be four episodes you share with your students often over the next few years. 
We appreciate you listening, Pat. We appreciate you coming back to the show. I'm sure we'll see you again very, very soon. It was and as always, fly safely and stay behind the prop. Thanks for checking out the Behind the Prop podcast. Be sure to click subscribe and check us out online at BehindTheProp.com. Behind the Prop is recorded in Houston, Texas. Creator and host is Bobby Doss. Co-host is Wally Mulhern. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not meant to replace actual flight instruction. Thanks for listening and remember, fly safe.